That was Queen Victoria's funeral in 1901. Now, the writer H.G. Wells said that when she died, it was as if a giant paperweight had been lifted off people's minds and ideas began to blow around like so many papers scattered in the wind. Last year was such a traumatic year, it's easy to overlook how this year ushers in the end of the first decade of the 21st century. And so tonight, I thought we'd pause to ask, how will we recall the first decade of the new century? Let's look at the past decade not as a catalog of events, but instead to see if there's a theme to be found. Let's be naughty, not naughty, tonight. What's the difference? Stay tuned. I'm Manolo Quezon to explain it. Let's start with a problem. How do we refer to the first decade of a century? It gets easier with the 20s, 30s, 40s, but what about the first two decades? The OOs, the preteens, followed by the teens? In his column, Michael Tan decided to adopt the term coined by the British newspaper, The Guardian, the noughties from not, or the British term for zero. Except as Richard Evans of The Guardian pointed out in our rush to mark the new millennium, the noughties began in 2000 and ended last year. The teens begin this year, but that means that the 20th century only had 99 years? Oh well, these things happen. Now even as people debate what to call the decade that just ended, or whether it ended last year or ends this year, the January 2 Inquirer editorial pointed out that most of us consider last year to have been so bad that 89% of us, according to an SWS survey, are optimistic about 2010. Now, we should be optimistic, the Inquirer says, because we have a chance to elect a new government. But as this free press editorial cartoon by the late Easy Ezon from the early 1960s shows, looking forward to change also means looking back at the broken promises of elections. We mark our lives, however, by cycles of 10, by decades more than by the electoral cycle. And if that's the case, ask yourself, what will be the iconic picture of the noughties? In the 1970s, the iconic image was of the strongman, of dictatorship. The iconic image of the 1980s was of people power and toppling that dictatorship, as you see here. And the iconic image of the 1990s was of the baby tigerhood of our newly restored democracy, the potential economic progress of the Ramos years. And what promised to be the iconic image of the noughties at first seemed to be this one, the one you're seeing next on your screen. The, there you go, the populist revenge of the underclass left out of the 1990s economic boom. Then it seemed the iconic image would be this next one, people power too, except that over the last few years as the government has tried to downplay and even disown Edsodos, it's less and less the iconic image. Could this one then be the iconic image of the noughties since officials want to erase Ed Sados? Will the first decade of the 21st century go down as a his in history as a catalog of increasingly ridiculous military demonstrations like the Peninsula Caper? Or will the iconic image be this of young post-Ed generation members overcoming the disillusionment and the effects of Ed Sados and reclaiming their place in the streets and in the public arena? Or will it be this already famous image from the Boston Globe of how officials and ordinary citizens, rich and poor alike on all sides of the political divide, were like ants in the face of nature's wrath? Newspapers of record, like the Inquirer, chronicle on their front pages the worst that humanity can do, whether well-intentioned political bumbling, or events that get bogged down in debates over whether they were simply freak accidents or cold-blooded acts of terrorism, or cases of greed taking people with it to the grave and our institutions being unable to do anything really serious about it. One thing is sure, this is the picture officialdom wants as iconic, a glorious regime, but out of the mouths of babes, as they say, comes the darndest things. One of these pretty little kids told abscbnnews.com over the weekend, I want my grandma to be president forever. And that, sad to say, is the dominant theme for the noughties. Rightly or wrongly, intentionally or not, while the image that may still be iconic has to be determined, the theme is already in a sense set in stone. 
If in 2001 to 2004, the president was in a sense held captive by allies, since 2004, she, she's been taken, the, taking down allies too big for their britches one by one. Along the way, each point scored by the presidents led to a public counterpoint. Every means has been tried to find a way to change things, but each path ended up problematic. If you had people's initiatives, you also had scrutiny by the public and the courts that threw out those initiatives culminating, more often than not, in public protest over official acts, especially when Congress, ideally the representatives of the people, got into the act. If you had officials trying to damage control by handing out CDs or issuing, issuing statements, you had legislators, on the other hand, trying to scrutinize those actions, but each attempt at oversight led to new and creative executive tactics to keep a lid on things, which led, in turn, to frustrated people going out into the streets to express indignation. If you had officials coming up with schemes to fight what they considered destabilizers by any means necessary, again, it provoked a hornet's nest of outrage each and every time, even if officials mocked the outrage as the usual statements by the usual suspects. And even the built-in safety valves of our society, elections, ended up becoming pressure points themselves which only emboldened offic officials to propose changing elections as we know them in turn, provoking people in turn to oppose such proposals as self-serving. Along the way, the theme has become larger than a single chief executive. It's become in many ways about institutions being in the hands of experts, the politicians, and a public unable to do anything about it aside from symbolic expressions of distaste. Whether Christian or Muslim, the crudest expression of the political prose has hug, have hogged the headlines too and underscored the theme <clears throat> of the incumbents doing anything if it even involves a backhoe to get rid of a problem. But some problems won't go away. They refuse to die, like Joseph Estrada, who was bumped off the political stage in 2001. They want to continue to make a comeback and thus they still divide us up to now. Since 2001, all questions have ended up returning to EDSA, whether dos or tres. And the decade has seen the main cast of characters get older, and the candidates for iconic picture of the decade just get more and more surreal. But there are other candidates too. We aren't just divided politically, we are divided spiritually. We are divided over whether our society should be more secular or retreat into the limbo that recognizes no line separating church and state. We're divided on how to deal with the rest of the world and the powerful nations that have gotten used to dictating terms. E.J. Dion in the Washington Post calls this, the first decade of the 21st century, the squandered decade. He's writing from an American perspective, of course, but the same could be said of us. The Noughties has been a decade of survival, of leaders trying to ensure their survival, of our democracy trying to survive, of our poor, our OFWs, our middle class, trying to survive mismanagement at home and economic crises abroad. And yet overall, it's sad to say Apollinario Mabini, who said at the turn of the 20th century what can be said of the first decade of this new one. To sum it up, he wrote in La Revolution 